Hey everyone, I'm Mike Mooney, and today Dr. Karen and I are going to talk about how champions stay champions. We're going to answer the question of how much is your reputation worth, and we're going to unpack why you need to keep digging. So if you're looking to stay competitive and stay in the race, you're going to want to hear more. How do you elevate your business reputation, and why is that important? This is part two of a two-part series with my special guest, Mike Mooney. If you haven't yet heard part one, then be sure to go back and listen to part one. Last time, we talked about Mike's illustrious career as an executive with NASCAR and other high-performance brands. Today, we pull back the curtain on what he's doing now and how he uses those corporate lessons to take other executives to higher speed careers. Some might say that Mike Mooney's 25 year career in professional motorsports was just going in circles. Actually, it perfectly positioned him to be an accelerator for people seeking to unlock speed and drive opportunities in their lives. His storytelling and lessons from many of his firsthand experiences with racing champions, where he watched them build and innovate their high performance vehicles to stay on track and to win. So Mike left his senior executive role with one of NASCAR's most respected teams with a passion and the tools to work with another type of high performance vehicle, people. You see, Mike believes we are all designed to be high-performance vehicles in this life. Yet, like race cars speeding at 200 miles per hour, we all need time for pit stops and tune-ups to keep us on track and in position to win. Would you help me in welcoming Mike Mooney? <laughs> hey, Dr. Karen, how are you? I'm how doing are you? Great. It's so good to see you again, Mike, and to have you on the show. Well, it's great to be back with you again. And thank you for having me back. I, I guess I didn't do too bad on the first one, or else maybe you would have said, ah, let's not worry about the, the second one. <laughs> no, as a matter of fact, Mike, I'm so excited about having you here because I want people to see what you're doing now. And I want to know how you're applying those success lessons to your new career. So that's what we're going to talk about a little bit today. So you gave a lot of wisdom last time. And that's why I'm <laughs> telling people, make sure they go back and listen to that if they manage to miss it. So we're just going to launch right in to what you have to share for us today. Okay. All right. That sounds great. That sounds great. All right. So you spent a lot of years, Mike, as a, an executive in the corporate side, mm -hmm. working with all kinds of high-end brands, which we named last time. And you also worked with motorsports organizations such as NASCAR, not only NASCAR, but many others. And then you transitioned to more of a speaking career at this point. So what was the transition like moving from executive to professional speaker? Tell us about that. I can tell you in one word, it was scary. <laughs> it was, uh, you know, Dr. Karen, it's some there, there are times in your life where um, you, you've got to, I don't want to say bet, but you, you leap into faith, right? You, you leap into faith and, and you know that there was something there that, um, I, I, that you were meant to do. And I believe that, that the, the previous 25 years in professional motorsports, you know, uh, and all the, the opportunities to work with amazing people and experience just incredible programs and, and uh, just that whole time was really a setup for what it is that I'm doing today, which is using the lessons, the, the experiences to help people really embrace right and, and give them the keys to the high performance vehicle that's within each of us but we often don't really embrace and recognize because we listen to other people too too much right get in our own heads yeah. that really does happen a lot and before we get into a lot of those lessons and i definitely want to make sure that we do i have yeah. another question for you how did your faith help you in your pivot out of motorsports 
because you mentioned it was scary to make this change and to make this transition. So where did faith come in for you? Yeah. How did it figure into the equation? Yeah, you know, when, when you think about leaving, I mean, people thought I was crazy, quite honestly. Uh, they said, wait a minute, you know, you've got, I'm using the air quotes, right? The best job ever uh, in, in motorsports and the, and the places you get to go and the people you get to work with. And, and, it, and it was, it was, it was fantastic. And the idea of, of leaving an industry where you have the relational equity, you have the technical skills, you, you know, I mean, I, it was, I could just close my eyes and, and do the work. Walking away from that wasn't easy to, to start something new. And, and, and that's, that's where I met before. It, it was scary because, you know, for the first time, a, I had to worry about this thing called cash flow. I, I didn't understand that because, you know, the last 25 years, I got the bi the biweekly steady was showing up, you know, and this truly was a, a, a time for me to, to really believe in myself. But you asked the question about where the faith came in. And quite honestly, Dr. Karen, I believe and I've surrendered to the fact that I'm just a vehicle. I'm just a vehicle, but but for someone else, right? And can I share the story with you on, on where that came from? Yes, by all means. We want to okay. hear the story. Okay. Please. So I'll, I'll take it back to July 8th, 2006, because that, that's when the seed for this was planted. And, and at that time, and the, the months leading up to July 8th, I was running the marketing communications for Nextel, uh, and, and it was for the Nextel Cup Series. At the time, it was the, the largest sponsorship in sports history at $750 million. And um, I was in my early thirties and, you know, at that time really just valued myself, my identity, who I was, was wrapped up in the commas in my paycheck, the title on my business card, the sway that I had in the office or wherever I was going. And our company was, um, we merged with Sprint at the time. And, um, shortly thereafter, I got a visit from HR and they said, Mike, thanks for everything, but your position has been eliminated. Now, suddenly everything that I hung my value and identity on was, was gone. And I, you know, tried to make things happen, tried to make things work. And the more they did, the more they would just fall apart, you know, because I was trying to make my plans come together. And it was on that July 8th evening, Dr. Karen, that, um, you know, I was in my, my bedroom uh, getting ready for bed. And my, my wife was getting ready for bed. Our th I put our, th our three children, young children uh, down to sleep. And I just got on my knees and um, I just said, I'm done. I said, I'm done. I just looked up. I said, creator, look, I, I'm done. I'm, I'm done trying to make this happen and work. It's too much for me. I'm just giving this up. Just if you would tell me what to do, just tell me what to do. I'll do it. I promise. But I'm, I, I can't do this. I just can't do this. And in that moment, Dr. Karen, I had one word hit me right here in the chest. It wasn't here in my monkey head. It was, it was here in my chest. It was one word. Speak. I said, okay, great. Uh, <laughs> about what? <laughs> Give a brother a little more to chew on, please. You know, I went to bed, got up the next morning, got a phone call around nine in the morning from a buddy of mine I had lunch with the day before. He works at uh, Hendrick Motorsports. And he said, Mike, I don't know why I didn't think of it yesterday at lunch, but it hit me last night when I was getting ready for bed. You know, we need a speaker to come in next month for this association that I'm with. Would you come speak? And it wasn't like, would you come give a presentation? Would you come talk? It was, would you speak? I kind of looked up and I said, uh, okay, I, I'm going to be faithful. So I did, you know, and and uh, I said, what do you want me to talk about? And he said, whatever you want, you have 20 minutes. And um, at that time, you know, I saw a shift in reputations and how they were being managed with technology and message boards and forums. Social media wasn't even here yet. Anyway, so I did a talk on, uh, on, on technology and the, the changing world of reputation management. And that led to a keynote that I followed Lou Holtz on and other things that I'm like, oh my gosh, this must be it. But I got a nudge that said, no, 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 I just wanted to show you what could be there? You've got more work to do, my friend. You've got more experiences, more tools to gain, more people to meet. So I spent the next 12 years in the sport being faithful and working until 
it was uh, time for me to, to pivot out. So yeah, I appreciate you, you listening to that part of the story, but that, that's where the faith came in for me, that, that I knew that what I was doing was a leap into faith, not a leap of faith, because it wasn't me and it's not my plan and I'm just a vehicle. I'm so glad that you shared the story because the story is very profound. And as people of faith, God is speaking all the time. He's speaking mm-hmm. every day. And sometimes it's not enough for us when we hear that one word, speak or whatever it is. Well, what does that mean? What am I supposed to do? And really think an important part of your story was that moment of surrender where you said, I can't do this anymore. And then God says, okay, you may not be able to do it, but I can do it. But he was waiting, you know, for you to get to the place where you said, I can't do it. And now you're open for him to lead, for him to guide. And then he shows you the new direction and the new path. And as you were saying, it doesn't happen overnight either. You had to go through some preparatory steps before you were ready to to take off and do a lot of what you're doing now. I'm remembering back. It's been, at the time of this recording, it'll be about 27 years since when I started Trans Leadership, which is my company. And I recall when I came out of the military and a lot of people said to me, well, why are you leaving the military? I mean, of course, that's stable and you're doing well. But I knew that my season in the military was supposed to be temporary. I knew it wasn't permanent. I knew I was supposed to be doing something else. I also knew that in the something else, there was another transition. I stopped off at a, a premier training organization, the Center for Creative Leadership, for a number of years, still affiliated with them in a small way at this point, but still affiliated. And that was going to be part of the foundation for what I'm doing today as well. So you're right. You spent the 12 years. We know Moses spent 40 years on the back side of the desert. We get prepared, you know? Yeah. Oh, and, and there was there was more desert, my friend. I mean, it wasn't like, you know, here you go. It's like, no, 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 we're going to, you, you got more desert to walk through. And and you're right, you know, it, it, and there are times when we find ourselves in a place where, and this is what happened to me at the race team, where that was supposed to be temporary provisions, but I was getting ready to build the foundation of a house. You know, I'm like, oh, I can stay here forever. This is great. And then it's like, oh, I'm going to make this really uncomfortable for you. And you're going to, you're going to want to have to go, you know, and that's, uh, that's what happened. So yeah, you know, but, but all of these things, like you're saying for you in the military and then going with, with the, 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 the leadership and training group, these are all setups for us. You know, they're all important steps in our story, but more importantly, in building the credibility and the authenticity and the confidence and, and what it is that we're, we're here to share and, and the missions that we're, we're all on. Don't you think? Absolutely. I think that's true. And sometimes we are not sure that it's the case. I think about birds and the way that when the little bird doesn't want to get out of the nest and fly, the mother bird, the parent birds, they start tearing the nest apart, taking the nest apart so that there's no comfy nest for you to sit in anymore. It's time to go. And God does that with us. He creates circumstances and situations that we will find untenable. Oh, no, I'm not staying there. It's time to roll. And he knows, you know, how to speak our language to, 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 to move and to roll. And like in your case, with this guy calling you the next day, saying they needed a speaker, he also knows how to give us encouragement on the journey. I remember the first week that I had started trans leadership and fax machines were just, <laughs> just kind of come out, you know, they, they were a new craze and nobody knew my fax number. Somebody sent me a fax. And it was about an opportunity that was in the leadership space. I knew that this was not the opportunity that I was supposed to pursue, but the way I understood the message, it was God saying to me, I know your fax number. I know where you are. And whatever opportunity I need to send you away, I'm sending it. You yeah. know, it's confirmation. Well, and, and it's also getting our heads out of the, the rut. This is going to sound bad, but but I believe that we often live our lives and people say, oh, you're on the hamster wheel. Yeah, I get that. But I also think we, we prairie dog, you know, where we're down, digging, digging, digging every once in a while. Look up and then get right back down again, you know, and 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 I think that when those moments with the fax machine or, you know, my friend calling me, if we are aware and present to recognize that it's more than just a phone call, it's more than just a fax. 
And I'm going to I'm going to embrace it that way and then see what comes, because it may not be the answer, but it could be a shift in my thinking that now I'm now I'm, I'm really curious and, and I'm, I'm tapping into something here, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. So it's having the ears to hear and the eyes to see what mm. the spirit is saying at any given time. Yeah, that's yeah. exactly what you and I are talking about right now. And, yep. and, you know, it sounded scary to me when you were describing you know, the, this merger that happened, you know, with Sprint, and then all of a sudden HR comes in, job over. That sounded scarier to me than, you know, moving to do something. Different. Oh, well, well, Dr. Karen, let me, let me tell you the other part of the, the shift out of, out of motorsports to speaking was that I knew that I needed to have a bridge to get me to the next phase, you know, and my wife, she's my, my partner in crime. we We've been together 30 years, married for it'll be 26 years this this um, next month, you know. So she was the one standing next to me. And and when we had to get ourselves ready, was like, look, I'm going to go back to work. So I, we have insurance. We'll get the credit cards paid off. We'll move to a smaller house. Like all these things. She's like I, this, this is this is where you, you want to go. And I want to help you get there. When I made that transition, though, I said, I, I'm not going to just come right out of the gates and people are going to say, hey, Mike, come speak for us. You know, it takes time to build that up. So I had actually lined up. I had lined up six people with handshake deals that, that I knew that said that, Mike, when you make that jump, we'll bring you in, you know, as a contractor and do work just to help get the cash flow going for you. You know, um, the, 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 the company I was with, you know, we, we had a, a, a transition plan that was going to be like five plus months. And, and literally when as one day the company came in and said, Hey, we're going to make that transition window more like 45 days. And then and I know, Corinna, I told my wife, I said, baby, this is going to be great. I've got this time and I got these people, how many of those six people, Dr. Karen, do you think showed up when I said, hey, I pulled the ripcord, I'm out, let's get zero, to work? Zero, <laughs> Around Round number, exactly. So I had to like go home and tell my wife, my supporter, my best friend, hey, remember that plan? It doesn't exist anymore. And I had a choice in that moment to like go back to my old job and ask for that job back. And I didn't. I said, I, I, I can't. And that wasn't pride or ego saying I can't. It was I've made a decision to go down a path to something that that's going to be different, better, greater, I believe. And, and I've got to go down that path. But it was I mean, there were a lot of nights I woke up at three in the morning saying, why is it 150 degrees in here? Why am I sweating? You know, and I can't sleep. There were a couple of days where I, I went for four days without sleeping because I had to figure it out. I had to get a plan together. So, you know, it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy, but is it worth it? As I look back, absolutely. Did it show me something inside me I didn't know I had? Absolutely. Do I lean on that every day today? Absolutely. And you're able to come alongside other people who are faced with similar choices and challenges, and they have to take the leap too. And you can say, I, I've been there. I've done that. I know <laughs> what it's like. I can be a guide because if this is not theoretical. I was on the backside of the desert. I was there when zero people stepped forward. You know, mm -hmm. I was there when I didn't know what the next step really was going to be or if I was going to really have a safety net or not. Yeah, absolutely. it was gone. Right. It, it was yeah. gone. I mean, absolutely. I'm, I'm, I'm a practitioner all day long. Everything. It, I'm a practitioner, my friend, just, just as you are. That's really the only way to operate and live is to continue the practice. You talked about authenticity the last time. And one of the things I would say is that when people can see, okay, you've walked this journey too. You're not just telling me to take a flying leap and you've never had to take a flying leap. You know, <laughs> right, right, so yeah. I think it's got more credibility when we've taken flying leaps, not seeing a safety net and somehow we've landed anyway. And we're walking into the destiny and purpose that has been planned and ordained for us. So, I mean, I think that's an important part of your story. Just because you got the vision and the big picture message, it doesn't mean that every step after that is easy or that you see clearly through to the end. Or that, that it's over. I mean, quite honestly, I really think that's the beginning. Yes. That's the beginning. That, that's the, okay, there's the call. Do you have the courage to answer? Yes. And you've seen this in my emails, Dr. Karen, where I sign off with the phrase, keep digging. And, and it's a phrase that I use 
in a lot of talks or when I'm interacting with people. And, you know, in racing, that was the phrase that, that, that you'd hear the crew chief say over the radio in the toughest times of the race and the long race and the fight when the driver's in the heat of it, or the pit crew needs to really just you know, dig into their moment, you, you would hear the crew chief say, okay, boys, let, let's keep digging, you know, and it's really that rallying cry to like, let's dig in, let's get the work done, right? Shortly after I made the pivot out, I, I read this, this great quote that completely shifted that, that thought of what that really means. And, and it said this, it said, I've seen the creator move mountains, but I still have to pick up my shovel every day and dig. Mm. You know, and that again, keep digging, you know, just because you got the call doesn't mean you can sit on the couch now and wait for the abundance to show up and wait for the dreams to come true. Now is the time to get your hands on the shovel, get the calluses built up, get the work done, start sweating, but it's worth it. It's worth it. All right. Now, since you mentioned, Mike, this whole thing about the prairie dog digging, <laughs> what's the difference between this digging and the prairie dog digging, just in case anybody gets confused? That is that is awesome. That is awesome. I, I would say the difference is, is this. The prairie dog is digging because it, it's sort of instinctual, right? And it's just trying to be safe in, in, your, in, in your home, okay? When you have a shovel in your hands and you're digging, you've got a tool and you're digging with purpose. I think that's the difference in my mind. It's the difference between digging on instinct, which we can also relate to as just sort of like on remote control and just kind of you know, cruise control, sleepwalking, however you want to say it, or truly digging with purpose because you know that the work you're putting in is going to reap amazing benefits for you that purely in your name alone, but you've got to dig every day. Thank you, because I I knew there was a difference, and I didn't want my audience to be confused out there. You know, so, wait a minute, he just said, "Don't be a prairie dog." So, right. what, what is going on here? Yes, there's That's a it. huge difference, and thank you so much for outlining it in that profound way, so we could remember. That's great. Well, thank you for asking, because I would have hated for people to say to think the same thing. Well, prairie dog, we're digging every day. No, 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 different digging. <laughs> exactly. So, tell us a little bit, Mike, about what is it that you are speaking to leaders and organizations about these days and why is what you're talking about important as um i've worked around championship drivers and teams for for decades and and watched them you know work on these high performance vehicles their race cars right tuning them up and innovating and constantly finding ways to make them better to stay competitive you know it really became clear to me dr karen that look you know i've got this set of tools from what I've been around the people I've been exposed to, the systems that I've seen, the mindsets, the way that they approach challenges and find opportunity and adversity, you know, that I have tools for another type of high performance vehicle. And that's people. That's you and me. It's people every day. And, and I believe that what I'm bringing to, to organizations and leaders is an opportunity, right? I want to bring them into a conversation and share with them a framework of how champions operate, you know, in the areas of peak performance and, and continuous improvement, mindset and reputation, because I, I believe with all of my my being that those are four components, right? Four gears, if you want to call them, that can just unlock transformational change and opportunities for all of us. So why do we need that today? My goodness, you know, I mean, think about what we've been through the last two years. You know, I started talking with more leaders during COVID who said, Mike, we love the, 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 the reputation message that you have because it's so vital in today's hyper-connected world. But I've, got, I've got people on my team that, that are high performers that are falling off of high performance habits. I've got people who can't connect and engage at work because of, of their mindsets. They're, they're not in the right place. They're, they're in an emotional state. Do you have anything that can help me with that? I so said, my gosh, that sounds like like every Sunday at the racetrack of what we would deal with as, as, as a team. So, yes. So that's what I'm bringing forward and why it's so important today, because people people are waking up to knowing that there is more. They can be more. They can deliver more. And, and I want to help. I want to help them. You know, I want to help them start that vehicle up. Great. So, you know, that there are some activities that high performance people engage in yeah. that people who are just kind of cruising along, maybe not thinking about being high performance, they don't engage in these methodologies or these practices 
and so on. When you think about both, let's say, mindset as one, and then maybe some other high performance habits, just give us a couple of nuggets about what are some of those? What's important? Yeah. So, so here, here's one I'll, I'll share right now because we're we're we all have dealt with this in some way, shape, or form over the last couple of years in, in this pandemic related to mindset, and and it's the power of emotion, the power of emotion. Uh, you know, emotion is not bad. Emotions aren't right. They aren't wrong. They just are. The thing is, is that an emotion is a signal of a feeling. It's just a signal of a feeling. The challenge is that we often let that emotion become a state of being. That's where we have to like really create opportunities to hit pause so we can recognize the feeling and ask yourself, why am I feeling this way? Okay, great. And then here's the key, Dr. Karen, is now what am I going to do about it? What can I do? How do I move to action? How do I release this emotion? Because if we don't and we stay in emotion that becomes a state of being, now we start getting into a space of anxiousness, fear, depression. They become a part of our life in a state of being versus just a moment. So one of the big uh, messages that I have is like, you know, how does emotion fit in your world right now? But more importantly, what action can you take to release that and not have it sit within? You know, we're skipping stones over, over some deep water with that, but that's just one, one area for mindset. You know, one of the things about that that strikes me is that word you used before about intentionality. In other words, the emotion comes and it takes some intentionality to say, okay, how do I want to work with this? How do I want to utilize it? I almost think about the martial arts of like Aikido and be, you've got the punch coming towards you, but you're shifting the energy for your own benefit and purposes intentionally. Yes. Yes. 100%. And, and that, that action could be a phone call. It could be a conversation. It could be just getting up and taking a walk. It's about releasing what's inside of us. There's a reason why the science of physiology says that, you know, movement action will release the emotion, you know, and the things that end up getting stuck in us, right? Especially during stressful, anxious times that we've, that we've been living in. So it's okay to be, to feel an emotion, just recognize what it's signaling as a feeling and then act. Don't sit in it. Don't sit in it. It's kind of like thinking about traffic lights. If you see a green light, if you see a yellow light, if you see a red light, it's a signal. Mm -hmm. And that signal tells you what you should do next, whether you should be stepping on the accelerator, the brake, or preparing to stop or whatever. And we have to learn to read the signals is what I'm hearing you say in this as well. It is. It is. Absolutely. Absolutely. What else are high performance people doing? Mm -hmm. Let's give another example. It doesn't have to be mindset. It could be something else. Something they're doing as a regular discipline that the ordinary mortals might not think to do. (laughs) Yeah. You you know, um, when we think about creating change in our lives or at work or in relationships, we often think about the big things that we've got to do, right? I mean, we'll start making a list and it's like, oh, you know, I've got to do this and this and this. And suddenly, suddenly you've got this long list of have to do's. And it can become really overwhelming. And what happens when we get overwhelmed, we often shift our attention to something that's less overwhelming, (laughs) that might be less challenging. Uh, That's like, yeah, that was bothering me then, but it's not really bothering me now. I'm going to move on to something else because that was really too much. So, So two things within that, Dr. Karen. One is the power of words, right? And it's not just the power of words that we use with others. Our, our colleagues, our family, our children, you know, uh, friends, whomever it may be. But it's also the power of the words that we use between our ears, because those are the words, quite honestly, that resonate most and we hear most often, don't we? Right? The, the, the words we hear when they wake us up at two or three in the morning when, when we're having those moments, right? Or before a meeting or before whatever it might be, it's those words up here. So maybe just a little shift and looking at a list of things that I have to do of things that I get to do, right? I get to do this here. Oh, I have a lot that I've got to do. Well, I have a lot that I I get to accomplish today. You know, little nuances in the way that you're looking at the words. So the other thing that they do, the high performers are, are focused on is not 
just 100% effort and saying, I've got to get all this done. No, no. They look at it and say, what's the 1% of daily improvement that I can bring forward? Okay, so now we're breaking something large into something small and recognizing about what's the 1% today that I can do. And this is what champions do. I, I saw it week in and week out, day in and day out in, in racing. They're always looking for that 1% of daily improvement because they know that the cumulative effect of 1% daily improvement over the course of the year is substantial, absolutely substantial in the momentum that it builds. And if we could do that, you know, just find that 1%. If you've got this big goal, then that's great. Find the 1% that you can do each day and just do that. Just do that for, for the day and then get up and do it again tomorrow. Yeah, those are both fabulous. I want to mention a couple of things about them. When you shift from I have to do something to I want to do something, it also shifts your energy. Yeah. When I have to do something, it's like a drudgery and, and I can't really mobilize all of my resources in the same way. But if I get to do something, right. if I want to do something, now I'm marshalling my energy towards that thing that I want to do. And it's more of everything's tracking towards me moving forward towards that goal and objective, rather than having sort of like a headwind holding me back, you know, it's, in a sense. It's a weight, right? Yeah. The, the weight of, oh, I have to get all this done. Oh my, you know, and, and unfortunately, a lot of people, we get conditioned, especially in the corporate world, Dr. Karen, that that's a badge of honor. You know, look, look at all my to do's. I'm in back to back to back to back meetings. And uh, OK, well, maybe you got to look at your time management a little bit better. Maybe maybe that's one thing. Maybe the other is you shift in how you're getting those done and how you're, you're speaking to yourself. I love that the way that the energy follows the intention, mm. you know, so if your intention is on being productive and being positive and finding a way to accomplish more and be more and support more. It's not just about you, but what you can do for others to lift them up. That energy is going to follow as well. And others are going to feel that. Man, what an impact that can be. That's a huge impact. And then I'll just say, you know, I'm remembering back when you were talking about the way you break something big down. And I'm remembering back to when I was working on my dissertation now, if you think about a whole dissertation, it is mammoth. It's it's huge. It's daunting. It seems impossible. And I decided, okay, let me break it down. What am I doing today on it? You know, right. what am, how That's much right. writing I'm going to do? But how many paragraphs? How many chapters? Or how long am I going to write it? And then one day, I remember looking up and saying, and saying, "It's finished." I was like, "What? Is it really finished?" You know. And it really was because yes. it was by by doing it in the small chunks like that, it made it less onerous. It was very yes. doable. And the next thing I knew it was done. And so I think that your strategy makes a lot of sense. I believe it because I'm a product of it as well. We talked about being practitioners. When when I had this idea of, of writing a book, I probably maybe like yourself, this idea of going for, for you know your, your doctorate, that's intimidating. And I remember this thing, okay, look, I can write a sentence I can turn into a paragraph, I can turn into a page. So let me just start there. And, and I was never really an early riser, uh, but I started getting up at 4.45 in the morning and I would write from 5 a.m. to 6.15 a.m. And that's when we got our kids up, right? Because I didn't want it taking away from the family time. Uh, but I did that. I, I wrote from 5 a.m. to 6.15 a.m. seven days a week for seven months. And that's it. That's it. I mean, no magic, like yourself with the dissertation, no magic. You just showed up and you just each day chipped away at it and chipped away at it. And before you know it, you're like, oh my gosh, you've got your dissertation. I've got a book. How'd this happen? I don't know. I just showed up and I, I, I did the work. Mm -hmm. I, did, I, I kept digging, right? Like Wonderful. you. Yeah. I love that. Great example. So speaking of books and your book, let's get to your book for a little bit. So, <laughs> that was a nice segue. I didn't mean for that to be the segue, by the way. It's a just... wonderful segue. <laughs> so why did you write it? And when people read it, what can they expect to get out of it? Many of the years that I was in motorsports, uh, being in public relations, part of that role is dealing with crisis management. And, and a lot of crisis management, if you think about the impact, impacts reputation. And, you know, I had been dealing with a lot of different crisis situations. And, and, and many times I just would scratch my head because I'd say, why weren't we asking the question, what if, instead of now, it's like, what now? 
right? And I, I had this one question, Dr. Karen, come to mind. I'm going to ask, I'm going to flip this on you now. I'm going to ask you a question. But the, the question was this, and this became the catalyst for, and, and the centerpiece of the book, which was simply this, how much is your reputation worth? So if I were to ask you right now to put a dollar value on your reputation, what would that dollar value be for your reputation? Priceless. And I really mean that because if you ask me to put a dollar value on my life, for example, mm-hmm. there's no amount of money that can make up for my life. If somebody kills me and then they pay my family millions of dollars, it does not bring me back. It's not right. enough. Your reputation to me is priceless like that. Yeah. 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 And, and I, I love that. When I ask that question, I get three answers usually. One of them is it's priceless. Uh, when I speak with financial groups or groups of economics or accountants or other you know, leaders, they get, oh, it's, you know, I had one person say it's 10x my current salary. You know, so, so they're, they're betting on future opportunity gains based on their reputation, right? Because it does. A reputation will, will create gravity to bring opportunities to you. Well, and, and I do believe that they're still undervaluing even at 10x, but that's just my opinion. Especially then, it depends on what their salary is now. <laughs> <laughs> right. So the, the third answer that I get, this is the one that I love, love, love. Because it, it, it shows me that the light switch has just flipped. And that, that answer is, I never thought of it that way. Ooh. And isn't it often the case with reputations is that we, we don't fully recognize its value until after we've paid a price. So I thought, what if I could write a book? What if I could share from my stories and examples, right? From, from my career, ways that we could be proactive. That's the whole idea of this reputation that shift. The, the title has dual meaning in there. One is that in, in racing, you have to shift in order to move forward and go. But this idea of shifting from a reactive approach to, to reputation management to a proactive idea of reputation design based upon our values was something that I thought could really be of value and impact people in a positive way as we live in a world where now, I mean, people, you see it in the headlines where a tweet or a comment, these aren't phones anymore, right? We're all citizen journalists. So, you know, the idea that we, we have to be vigilant and that our reputations have never been more valuable yet vulnerable and fragile any other time in human history. Oh yeah. It doesn't take long for something to spread. Now it spreads nope. like wildfire on social media and so on. And a lot of companies are even researching people on social media to see what they are saying and what other people are saying about them. Exactly right. And they exactly may not right. even know why they don't even get a job is because of all the stuff you were talking about. You know, yes. that yes. makes the company wonder, are you really a values fit for our, you know, culture? And the speed at which these messages are traveling is just increased exponentially. It's, it's, it's unprecedented. You know, th- there's a uh, there's a cartoon that, that I came across, and, and I use this in some of some of my keynotes when I'm talking about reputation, and, and it gets back to what you were saying about HR directors and and people like looking people up online to, to look at what I call their social footprint. Mm-hmm. You know, just to see is there continuity. And and in this cartoon, there's a hiring manager behind the desk looking at the resume and the and the applicant anxiously sitting sitting on the other side. And, and the, the comment from the, the uh, hiring director as well, according to LinkedIn, you are detail oriented and focus on deadlines, but according to Facebook, you like Jack Daniels and are very comfortable with your body. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just showing that, you know, people, they are looking for continuity and they're looking, especially in hiring are looking to see. What are you posting? How is that going to represent us as an organization? Because you will be representing us when you work with us. Absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, you've got a lot of content from your past experiences. You're speaking about some of that. You've written a book. You're speaking about it. How are you connecting the dots between the book and the speaking? And how are these topics that you're writing and speaking about, how are they personal for you? Hmm. 
Well, they're personal to me because uh, they they speak the language that I learned over 25 plus years in in motorsports, in NASCAR, IndyCar, drag racing, Formula One. And what I've what I've done with that word again, being intentional, is I find the story or the lesson and and look for how it relates back to the world that, that I operated in, right? So for example, um, if, if I were to ask you on the race team, who has the most vital job on that team? Is it the driver? Is it the crew chief? Is it the pit crew? Is it the team owner? Like who, who do you think has the most vital job on the race team? I don't know. It's a hard question to answer. And I'll tell you why, because at least in my experience in working in corporations, every team member has such an important role to the success. And even if you think about sports, if you think about basketball and you think about somebody like a Michael Jordan back in the day who could dunk all kinds of baskets, but if you're not functioning as a team, you're still going to lose. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. So, so yeah. you know, yeah. it's hard yeah. to say. Yeah. Well, in, in this team sport, and, and you're right, everyone has a role to play. A lot of people think because the driver is the most visible on the team or the pit crew, the most visible during the race, they often think it's it's that that person. The reality is that the most vital role on the team is a person called the spotter. Ooh. And the spotter is the person who stands high atop the racetrack property and has a pair of binoculars and radio communication to the driver and the team. And it's the spotter's responsibility that while the driver is laser focused on their goal of protecting their position or gaining position, that the spotter is the person telling the driver what's happening in their blind spots. The places that if they get up into can take not only them, but others out of the race. So if you think about it, you can have the best driver, the fastest pit crew, but if you can't keep that race car on the track, none of that matters. So, you know, the analogy there, Dr. Karen, and this is what I bring to audiences and and organizations is how are we any different than those drivers? We all have blind spots, don't we? And the blind spots may not be just in our operations. It could be siloing departments. It could be poor communications with our key stakeholders. It could be those types of business operational you know, procedures that, that we're doing on a regular basis that are causing us to lose opportunity, hurting reputation, hurting our team. So answering your question, to me, it's how can I take the language that, that I've worked with and been around with these champions and apply it in a way and share it through a lens that gets people thinking about how they're operating, interacting, building trust, teamwork, communication, collaboration. How can they do that a bit differently, a little more effectively? Actually, I love that. I didn't even know there was a role called the spotter. See? Yeah, <laughs> and, 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 and people generally don't. And then I, I challenge folks to ask, them, hey, so, so who is your spotter? Yes, that's the you right know? question. Who is your spotter? Who's the person who's going to tell you what you need to hear, not just what you want to hear? It's a big yeah. distinction in that. Absolutely. Identifying what's in the blind spots. I mean, I'm thinking about it in terms of my life as a consultant. I know I'm a spotter for a lot of my clients. I mean, to see <laughs> things that they don't see because I'm right. going to be looking at it from a different vantage point and so on and so forth. But yeah, I love that that concept. That's really, really important. So <laughs> It is. So that, that's what that's what I share you know, some of those uh, strategies in, in the book and a lot of my messaging around peak performance or continuous improvement and mindset really all comes from and through that lens of, of story, lesson, reflection, right? To, to get people excited that, that they, they can do more. So give them that, that confidence, right? But also giving them some like use now tools and resources to, to, to work with. Yeah, that sounds phenomenal. Certainly sounds worth reading and for people to pay attention to. So now let me ask you this, Mike. We talked about the challenge of going into this new career. We talked about being on the backside of the desert and all these hard things. If you look back to when you started the speaking career and you had a vision in -hmm. your head about what that was going to be like, and now that you're squarely into it, how is that vision from the past squaring up with the current reality? What would you say? I'd say it's more than I could have even imagined, honestly. 
I'm not trying to sound cliche or, 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 or cagey with that. Like what the opportunities that, that I have today that, and what I, I get to do with amazing people, like speaking with you, I would never, I never dreamed of that. I never, like, I had a, I had a, a thought and a vision of, of what could be, but what I'm doing is, is not even in, in my wildest imaginations. I would have limited myself, you know, just by my own humanness. Uh, would have limited what I thought that I, I could achieve instead of quite honestly, and this gets back to the keep digging of just, you know, what, what I, I learned about when that safety net was pulled away was the power of today. Like, it, you know, my wife said to me, she's like, she said, babe, what happens when we get to this date and the money's not there anymore? What do we do? And, and I, I, I said to her something that I don't think any partner or friend wants to hear. I said, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I said, look, I'll, 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 I'll drive Uber. I'll, I'll get another job. I'll, but I'll figure it out. But, but babe, here's the thing. If I'm focused on that date, I'm focusing on the wrong thing. I got to focus on today. I've only got so many hours today and energy for today. And I believe if I do that today and tomorrow, then that date's going to take care of itself. And that was indeed what happened. You know, I did that. And, and within, you know, a month, I landed a couple of speaking gigs. I, I got a, a client to work with, you know, and things started to happen. So I, I really believe that where I am today, I couldn't imagine it. But but that's the amazing thing, because what could be in the future? I don't know, but it's going to be pretty, pretty cool. It's going to be pretty cool. I'm just, just going to keep showing up and doing <laughs> doing my work, you know? Well, you're really unpacking a concept that I really believe in. It's a biblical concept that comes from Matthew, the sixth chapter, the whole notion that if we're doing the work of today and what we're supposed mm -hmm. to be doing today, then tomorrow will take care of itself. Yeah. Because what we do today is actually the foundation for what is supposed to happen tomorrow. Now, yeah. if I'm so worried about tomorrow that I don't do what I'm supposed to do today, then I've compromised today and tomorrow. You know? <laughs> yes, yes. And, and, and worse yet of compromising what do we often do? And I've done this. I, and I'm, I'll, I'm not ashamed to say it. I start picking up bad habits. I may drink more than I need to. I may start doing things that kind of numb the fear or kind of distance myself. I stop working out. I stop meditating. I'm, I'm not eating well. Um, and all of those things, you know, also add up. And that becomes a state of being as well, right? You get back to that power of emotion. It's a slippery slope, Dr. Karen, right? It's a slippery slope that, you know, sometimes not facing or doing the work may seem easier, but it's not going to, for right now, but it's not going to make it easier for down the road. Exactly. It's not going to make it easier in the long run. That's for mm -hmm. sure. When you look at the long-term lens. So knowing yeah. what you know now, you've made this transition you've gone through some of those hard times and you're watching other people as they're going through it. So if you had to counsel yourself yeah. from who you are today and that person way back then who wasn't sure how this was going to turn out, or even somebody now who's right at the beginning of such a journey, mm -hmm. what is it that you would tell this person who's about to step out there now yeah. or your old self that yeah. couldn't have known what you know now, what advice would you give? I'd probably drop an F bomb on them. I would, dro I would drop the, the F word and that's fear. Mm. I got you for a second there. You, 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 you were so like, what is he going to do? Funny. this? Are we going to have to edit this out of the show? <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to see if you were listening, Dr. Karen. That's I'm all. Listening, that's all. all right. <laughs> uh, I, I saw, I saw your eyes. Oh, so no, it's this word fear and, and it's the power that it has over us. I can remember driving home while I was still working for the race team. And, and I had been preparing. I knew this was going to happen at some point. And it was probably about three years of preparation that it took for me to, to have the courage to step out and, and, and step in and leap into that faith. And it was, it was work I had to do in here and up in here, more so than the skills and the book and the other pieces of that. It was really, do I have what I need in here? And that word fear, I was so scared. I was so scared of what was out there of that unknown. And I remember driving home one night and uh, I stopped at a red light and there's a big 18 wheeler in front of me. And there's a sticker on the back corner of this semi truck. And it said, or read, 
everything you've ever wanted is on the other side of fear. Mm. And I'm like, oh my gosh, okay, there's my sign. Again, being aware and present, you know. Then it dawned on me too that that faith and fear ask us to do the same thing. Mm. And it's believe in something you can't see. So which will you choose? You know, it really comes down to choices. You know, fear is suffered mostly in our heads, far worse than what is physically going to happen or could happen, quite honestly. But we often buy into fear versus faith. And it's not just secular faith in creator, but it's also faith in yourself, faith in your skills, your ability, your track record, right? So I would, you know, encourage those folks, your, your community, if you find yourself that place, is to lean, lean into faith. You know, I still work with fear every day, so don't get me wrong. You know, I'm not going to sit here and say, hey, I'm good. You know, no, I'm sure there's going to be more challenges. That's the only way we grow. That's just the way it works, right? But I have a word for this year. My word for this year, every year I've had a, a different word that I try to live into. And this year it's fearless. And and it's not it's not the notion of of being fearless, right? Of it's like I don't care, I'm going after it because we're all going to fear, feel fear. It, it's really it's fear less. I want to fear less this year and see what, how that changes my life and the lives around me. So I would just share that, and encourage people to maybe you know, spend some time on that and think about the role that fear plays in your life and how faith could take the place of it. And maybe try to live and fear less. You know, that's so powerful. I'm having this thought that the more we walk in faith, the more fear is chased back. Hmm. You know? Yeah, I believe that. You know, I do too. I, I really think so. I mean, there's yeah. no place for the fear if the faith is, is stronger. That's right. You know, that's the key. It's just, which one are we going to make? stronger and magnify if we will yeah. you know yeah. in our lives yeah and, and and maybe to put it in my language is who are you going to let drive the car who's going to oh, who yeah. let take the wheel right who are you going to let take the wheel? because mm -hmm. one of them will one of them's going to take the wheel <laughs> one of them is and you can't be a backseat driver in it or a passenger you, you yourself have got to take that wheel and decide are you going to drive it with faith or are you going to drive it with fear love it absolutely yeah. love that so so, Mike, how can people get a hold of you? They might want to access you for a speaking engagement or for some other reason. How can they get your book? Tell them about that again. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for, for asking and allowing me that, that opportunity. Uh, so people uh, can easily get a hold of me a couple of different ways. Uh, email is, is easy and great, and it's really simple. It's mike at mikemooney.com. And then you can also go to my website to uh, learn more about some of my work and messaging. And that's MikeMooney.com. Again, trying to keep it simple, right? With, with, with the, the old brand guy here. And then you can also get my book um, there on my website. Uh, if you buy there, I can sign, uh, sign it for you and send it out. You can go to Amazon as well and buy it there. You can also get the, um, the, the audio book uh, and that's uh, available on, uh, on Amazon too. And just in case people are a little bit confused, how do you spell Mooney? Yeah, that's M-O-O-N-E-Y. Excellent. Yeah. Thank we you. Know there's more than one way to spell things, and we want people to be in the right place, the that's right, right website. So That's right. That's right. So you've shared a lot of wisdom so far, both in this episode and the last episode. And I'm going to ask you again, what additional words of wisdom do you want to leave for my audience of executive business leaders. Yeah, so th this is, uh, if, if you watched the first episode, um, I, I mentioned that I'm very big on visual anchors, right? Because I tend, I can get wrapped up in my head. I need something visual and external to, to snap me back out of, of, of where I'm at. So um, I shared with you one index card that I had um, in, in the last show, which were these four words, right? Intentional action drives clarity, right? The idea of not being afraid to take the first step because you don't know what step five, six, and seven are. Don't worry. Take step one and two. The rest will start to unfold. You'll see more clearly with intentional action. But the one that I would, I also have on my desk that I would share with the audience as well is a simple one with, with three words, just three words. It's this, I am worthy. I'm worthy. You know, how often do we discount 
and devalue our own worth for the life that we can live, the impact we're here to create. You know, like I said before, we're all, we've all been designed to be high performance vehicles and vehicles for hope, vehicles for love, vehicles for inspiration, leadership, ideas, solutions. But we've got to embrace our worth. We've got to recognize that we are worthy of all that comes along with being our authentic selves and putting that forth in the world. So I would just encourage your community just to remember that you are worthy. You are worthy of that. Don't listen to the squirrel that, or, or the, the prairie dog that, that's uh, you know up in your head. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mike. I really appreciate you being here with me again on a Thank second you. segment of the show. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the opportunity. This, this is great. You make the conversation so easy and enjoyable. And, and again, I, I hope that your community is able to, to pick a couple of uh, nuggets out of here that, that serve them. So, so thank you so much. I hope so, too. And in fact, I'm going to say to the Dr. Karen Speaks Leadership and the Voice of Leadership audiences out there, please listen again to make sure that you don't miss any pearl of wisdom that Mike Mooney has shared with us today. He's talked about the fact that each of us is worthy because we are called on our journey for our unique purpose to bring hope and love and inspiration, leadership, ideas, and solutions to the world. He also has talked to us today about the fact that we can speak to ourselves in a kinder, gentler way. And rather than focusing on what we have to do, we can talk about and focus on what we want to do and what we get to do. He also talked about how that emotions can be used as a signal in our lives, and we can intentionally decide what action to take based on what that emotion is signaling that's coming to us, and we can turn things to our benefit if we are intentional about that. He also talked a little bit about how that we have to keep digging, though we don't want to dig like the prairie dog and just sort of like in by instinct, just mindlessly digging, maybe not going anywhere. But we want to see where God is actually building something, the, the big mountains that he's erecting and creating. And we want to show up with our shovels ready to go to work, carving out the part that we have been called to do. And those of us who are in leadership, just remember, you need a spotter to help you see the blind spots that you don't see. And so that you can go along that race journey with less accidents and more likelihood to win. And just remember, as a leader, you're also functioning as a spotter for someone else. That's important too. Now there's a lot more, but those are the things that stand out top of mind and you can go back and listen to hear the rest. And I just want to close our segment today with a reading that comes from Matthew, the fourth chapter. And here's what I want to say, because this reminds me of some things that Mike has been sharing with us. Jesus, when he was calling his disciples, he was calling people who were already at work doing something. They had a skill or an ability, and it was going to be a foundation for their later work. And he would have them to use that skill and to deploy it in a very different way than how they were deploying it at the time. Everything in your life that you've experienced, if you put it in God's hands, and if you walk by faith rather than fear, you can see everything that you've learned applied in a way that works well for you and for others. So I want to read Matthew 4, and this is verses 18 through 20. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon, called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Then he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. So walk in faith, my friends. <laughs> 